Hello and welcome everyone. We're just getting started and admitting a few folks from the waiting room, but we'll get things going. So welcome to the Labor Market Information Council's virtual panel and discussion on the labor market outcomes of immigrant youth in Canada. Today's event will be hosted in English only, but a French transcript and captioned recording will be made available on LMIC's website. If you would like to turn on live closed captioning for this event, you can click on the more button in the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom window and select captioning. I'm Ann Patterson, Director of Communications at LMIC. I'm joining you today from Ottawa, where I am grateful to live and work as a settler and supporter of land back on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, miigwech. Today, we're hosting a very timely discussion about the experiences of newcomer and immigrant youth in Canada's labor market, featuring youth researchers and career service providers. Today's event builds on the findings in the LMIC and Canadian Council for Youth Prosperity Report on the labor market outcomes of immigrant youth, as well as World Education Services' recent report on immigrant youth in Canada's labor market. If you haven't yet had an opportunity to read those two reports, my colleague Jade will put the links into the chat. Thank you, Jade. So before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to explain how today's session will work. So we'll be kicking things off with a 30 minute panel discussion featuring panelists from World Education Services, Skills for Change, and the Canadian Council for Youth Prosperity, moderated by Carl Nazaire, who is a Youth Workforce Engagement Specialist with CCYP, and then around 2.40 Eastern time, we're going to launch three breakout room discussions where you will have an opportunity to chat about some of the ideas, challenges, and opportunities that came up in the panel discussion. To start the breakout rooms, you'll be randomly assigned to one of three discussions and our hosts will introduce their areas of expertise and kick off a dialogue. Each breakout room discussion will be open for about 20 minutes and then you'll be automatically assigned to a new discussion topic for another 20 minutes. And then at the end of the hour, you'll have had an opportunity to participate in all three breakout rooms. So our first breakout room will be a discussion about what the data tells us about immigrant youth in Canada's labor market, hosted by LMIC research lead and Laura Fraken. Breakout room two will be a discussion about facilitating the inclusion of immigrant and refugee youth, hosted by Wes's Senior Manager of Knowledge Management and Mobilization, Monina Fabria. And breakout room three will be a discussion featuring the stories and experiences of immigrant youth in Canada, hosted by CCYP Engagement Specialist, Michelle Marujic. Around 3.45 Eastern, we're all going to come back together into this main room to wrap up the session. Um, and we do hope you'll be able to join us for this full event, including the three discussion sessions. But in case you can't stay for the whole thing, we will be sharing a recording afterwards. So with housekeeping out of the way, I am delighted to welcome our panelists. So I'm going to start by introducing our panel moderator, Carl Nazaire. Uh, we'll get Carl pinned up on the screen with me. Hi, Carl. So Carl is a youth workforce engagement specialist with the Canadian Council for Youth Prosperity, where he facilitates conversations and creates a welcoming environment for youth from diverse backgrounds. As a Haitian immigrant, Carl has a lifelong goal of creating equitable opportunities for marginalized youth. So thank you, Carl, for joining us, and I will pass it over to you to kick off our panel discussion. Thank you very much, Anne. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Anne, for and LMIC for convening this discussion today. I'm Carl Nazaire, an engagement specialist at the Kenyan Council for Youth Prosperity. I'm pleased to be here today to moderate this panel discussion about the labor market outcomes and immigrant youth in Canada. I'll be starting by introducing our panelists, and we'll jump right into the discussion. So joining us today is Serena Sandy, the CEO of Skills for Change, which is a charity that provides employment, social services, and settlement support to immigrant and refugee youth in the greater Toronto Hamilton area. Welcome, Serena. Next is Shalini, who has joined us from the Kenyan Council for Youth Prosperity. 
where she is the Director of Research and Policy Focus on Creating and Curating Research on Youth Workforce Development. Welcome, Shaleen. Um, next is Theresa Jones, who is a Policy and Program Coordinator at World Education Services, where she supports program and policy integrations for labor market integration of immigrant communities, including firsthand and secondhand youths, newcomers, refugees, and international students. Welcome, Teresa. And finally, Michelle Marushchik, who's an engagement specialist at the Kenyan Council for Youth Prosperity, where she promotes greater youth workforce inclusion by bridging the gap between employers and young people, creating resources to help them navigate barriers and championing more equitable and inclusive workplace environments. Thank you all for joining us today to talk about immigrant and newcomer youth and the labor market. I have some questions for each of you here, but before we do that, I'd like to open to this panel sessions by inviting each one of you to speak to your perspectives on the greatest challenges and opportunities facing immigrant youth in Canada's labor market right now. So Serena, I would like to start with you. Um, based on your experience leading Skills for Change, an organization that supports immigrant and newcomer youth, what do you see as the greatest challenges and opportunities facing youth and the labor market integration for youth right now? Uh, thank you, Carl. And um, thank you, LMIC, for putting this event together. And as Anne said earlier, please check out the, the um, research report. It's really good information that shows some of the gains that have made, positive gains that have made for newcomer youth um, post pandemic, as we know it. Um, but Carl, that is a really great question. I've, I've been here at Skills for Change as a CEO for the past 10 years. Um, and as you mentioned, we support immigrants. And in particular, well, we have uh, groups that uh, uh, team members that work directly with immigrant and newcomer youth. And we have observed several challenges, and there's also great opportunities facing labor, that impact the labor market integration rates of these groups of youth, um, especially racialized immigrant and newcomer youth over the last little while, and especially as a result of the pandemic. One of the significant challenges we have seen among our youth program cohorts at Skills for Change is a lack of confidence, particularly among those who come from low income backgrounds and are racialized or newcomers. Um, this lack of confidence can be a significant barrier to labor market entry, you know, when, when they are seeking employment. And it can really make it challenging for you to present themselves effectively in interviews and or networking events. So we really have to develop programs and uh, programs and services that are responsive to that. Another challenge um, that, you know, this particular group face is access to post-secondary education, which can be prohibitively expensive and uh, difficult for that group to retain. This is especially true for those who come from low-income backgrounds or racialized, uh, where um, systemic barriers can make it even more challenging for them to access education and training uh, programs and to thrive as, in those environments. We have a, a Black Youth in STEM project, and, and one of the challenges we've had um, is where some of the cohorts or the, the mentors talk about making that transition from low-income communities, going on campus, and lacking the tools and resources to be resilient to navigate the spaces that others who grew up with different um, opportunities were able to transition effectively. Um, so at Skills for Change, we understand the importance of mentorship for youth and have created programs to connect them with mentors and employers. And these mentorship programs help these immigrant and racialized youth to build a confidence, uh, develop new skills, uh, build networks that can help them secure meaningful employment. And so by connecting our youth clients with employers, we also aim to provide opportunities for them to gain that work experience and critically develop skills that can help them succeed in the labor market. Um, but despite these efforts, you know, racialized, racialized youth, uh, they, they still face significant challenges that um, could be related to unconscious bias, outright racism and discrimination, and that can limit their opportunities and continue to perpetuate in inequities. So it is really crucial for employers, um, policymakers, us in the nonprofit space who are doing career development and career management services to work to address the systemic issues and to, to work to create more equitable and inclusive workforces. Um, this would include promoting diversity and inclusion in the workplace, uh, implementing anti-discrimination policies, and creating and providing equal opportunities for all individual youth to succeed, all individual youth to succeed. So there are several opportunities that could potentially um, improve labor market integration of youth. Uh, some of that include you know, increasing a focus on digitization and technology, 
because it presents, um, it creates opportunities for youth who are often more comfortable with technology and possess those digital skills to enter the labor market. Um, I think it's great that we see the growing emphasis on sustainability and the green economy, which could really provide opportunities for youth um, in renewable energies and environmentally friendly industries. So those are opportunities that we can see being available. Um, we don't want to discount the, you know, the, the trend that started in the pandemic to more and more remote work um, and flexible work arrangement because it could benefit youth as they're often more mobile and adaptable than older workers. So the rise of the gig economy, even though it has challenged, could also provide more opportunities for youth to enter the workforce on their own terms. So those are really good opportunity. Um, and finally, there is an increase, you know, we could recognize the importance of skills training and education for you. That's an opportunity for governments and employers to invest in training and upskilling programs, the programs that can uh, prepare you job, you for those jobs of the future, for a future of work and increase the competitiveness in the labor market. So as the, the research has shown, Great strides were made, but there are many opportunities um, and they showed opportunities for you to succeed in the labor market. But it does require um, dedicated concerted effort from all stakeholders uh, who are working to create an environment where all youth have an equal chance to thrive. And here at Skills for Change, we, we feel that we play a really vital role, role in providing the kind of support and resources to our newcomer and racialized youth and connect, uh, in connecting them with opportunities for them to succeed. Thank you very much, Serena. As an immigrant, I can definitely relate to the fear aspect of, of mentorship and, and uh, job applications and, and uh, um, everything that comes with that. So I definitely appreciate your input. I think representation is very important in terms of battling against that. So thank, thank you. Um, Theresa, I'm very curious about your perspective on this as someone who works on the policy and program side of things. What do you see as the greatest labor market challenges and opportunities facing immigrant and newcomer youth? Thank you very much for the question, Carl. Um, so there are many ways to go about answering this. Um, however, I'll focus my response to a few uh, key challenge areas and I'll begin with access to settlement and integration supports. So there are a number of programs and services that are available across Canada um, and our government spends approximately $1.7 billion um, in funding for these supports. However, I think that it becomes more complex um, when accessing these services. So for many youth, they may lack the awareness that these um, um, programmings are available and also just making sure that there is more coordination within the sector to amplify these efforts. Um, depending on where you are settling across the country, so for youth that are going into more rural or smaller communities, there may be a lack of um, cultural affinity for them and culturally com competent sorry, supports that are available for these youth. Um, I would also say for the time of arrival, um, more recent immigrants, like they're more likely to access these critical supports within their first um, one to five years of being settled, but then as they are progressing throughout their, their journey in Canada, they still might need support, but it's not as readily available for them, I would say. Um, language learning supports, for example, even though these youth are attending school, they may be matched in, into, um, into um, academic programming that may be um, based on their, le their level of language and not necessarily their, their, their competency or intellectual um, potential but they are put into these programs that might be limiting in terms of them accessing the support that they need to, to learn and function in official languages. Um, I would also say that for the settlement and integration supports that are available for many youth, they are outside of the core working age population. So let's say if you're less than 25, um, there's less likely or less availability of supports that are targeted towards career development for youth that are trying to facilitate their school to work transition between um, their later high school years and then going on into to university. Um, another issue or challenge area that I would say um, for immigrant youth could be like the lack of social capital. So when you are coming to the country and you are as a newcomer functioning in society, um, you're often doing things from scratch and for youth that are arriving here or maybe are second gen um, that have parents that are also working towards establishing their base or having somewhat of a safety net in the country it is difficult to try and navigate that on your own. And so with limited support and having friends, making friends at school or having those connections that can help um, facilitate your entry into the workforce and having equitable work, for example, that could be something that's extremely um, difficult to have 
and it does impact your opportunity to be able to function um, fully in um, the labor market. Um, yeah, so as I had mentioned before, towards like a limited awareness or information provision that these supports are available for youth, that's another challenge um, as it pertains to social, social capital as well. Um, and then I think Serena had also touched on this in her, in her response as well, and that's um, bias and discrimination in the labor market. So um, one area that we have we have discovered in our research for the report, for example, was the um, lack of recognition of international credentials or those that are earned abroad. So for many youth um, coming into Canada, having that recognition of non-Canadian work experience or um, educational experience is something that does um, present a barrier for entering the labor market and obtaining success. So then this would then push youth into um, just having more of these um, survival jobs that are tend to be more low skilled or low wage, just to just to make it by and to get that foot in the door, that first experience. Um, but that creates more of a habit or um, more of a system in which they're put into these more precarious um, job opportunities that have limited growth career wise. Um, and then also, as mentioned by Serena, that that bias um, that comes from the racial or ethnic background as well as um, accents, things like that, um, zoning area of, of, of which they live, things like that bias that, that would um, reduce their opportunity to develop their skills going into the workforce. Um, so while these remain pressing challenges, I think that um, there is great work underway and it's integral that we continue to leverage and expand these opportunities to ensure that immigrant youth, that they are, they are increasingly enabled to succeed in Canada's labor market. So some of these opportunities include listening to and co-creating with these youth. So engaging with youth throughout the decision-making process um, and in towards the development of program and policy interventions that are responsive to their needs. Um, so it's important that youth are not only granted a seat at the table, but that they're enabled to help set it, right? So youth are brimming with ideas and they can and should be consulted as, as experts um, as it pertains to their needs and solutions that would help support them. Um, and they should be compensated for their time and expertise, right? Um, I also think that this involves investing in employment specific programming and initiatives such as work integrated learning opportunities. So that's the additional um, career support. And then these are opportunities that would enable them to build their social capital, expand their networks, get their foot in the door for additional opportunities. And this will help um, provide more of a cushion or safety net um, throughout their school to work transition. And we should also work intentionally, as, um, as Serena had mentioned, working intentionally towards reducing bias against, um, for example, non-Canadian work experience and also um, discriminatory practices within the workplace as well. Um, I also think that there's an opportunity here for us to co conduct and collect further research. You know, we understand through research and potentially lived experience, as we have on the panel here, that the pandemic signaled many career scarring um, socioeconomic impacts um, some of which you'll hear more about um, as we get into the breakout rooms where my colleagues will share uh, report findings. Um, so I think this it, it's important for us to be able to access and collect um, this disaggregated data to see the impact, the true impact across the immigrant youth demographic. And I think this is a, a great step in towards um, identifying gaps and developing strategies to help address these concerns. Thanks. Thank you, Theresa. I, uh, I like the point that you made with the 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 English speaking part, because I, I myself moved here when I was 14 and I failed my English literacy test in, in grade in grade 10. But like when I speak to people now, they never they're never able to tell if I'm either born here or born in Haiti. It's always surprising to them. But thank you. I I, I like that. Um Shalini, I'd like to ask you a question next. Um, as a researcher and economist, what challenges and opportunities do you see newcomer and immigrant youth facing in the labor market today? Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Carl. And uh, before I start, of course, um, thanks for inviting me here, LMIC team. And of course, it was a real pleasure to collaborate with Anne Lohr. So thanks you to her as a great collaborator. And of course, to my fellow panelists as well for being here today. So um, to answer your question, the, the, the key concern in here or the key challenge that immigrant youth face is the challenge of timing of, a, of arrival into Canada. Because um, we have research that shows that, you know, the bulk of immigrant youth who've come as 
children, you know, at school age uh, levels, they have actually had good, positive, strong outcomes, uh, employment outcomes on par with Canadian born youth, but the later you arrive, the harder it gets. And that's not brain surgery, right? Because it takes longer and longer for you to acquire, uh, you know, the skills and adjust to a new school system for that matter and things like that. So the, the research has shown that, um, that uh, you know, immigrant youth, established immigrant youth who arrived 10 years or more or before that um, have actually um, into adulthood, been able to um, get some pretty strong employment outcomes. And of course, it gets harder as, as, as you come, come in older and older into the country. So that's the first thing, so which obviously suggests that there must be um, uh, improvement in immigrant settlement services, those that actually catch the people who fall between the cracks because so far immigrant settlement sort of is geared towards family adjustment, but you do have uh, you know, an age group between the ages of 19 through 25 or 19 through 29 that uh, requires some specialized uh, sort of uh, networking capabilities and things like that. So that's where the opportunity sort of lies in this case. So it's the timing of arrival that matters, that poses the challenge to immigrant youth in terms of adjustment to labor market. And that's there's a lot of research to show that this is the case. The other big issue is, of course, lowered labor market participation rates that compared to Canadian born youth. And that has been historically true because, and not really that surprising because immigrant youth tend to pursue education at much higher rates than Canadian born youth have historically done. Okay, that's changing, of course, because employment rates have been rising for immigrant youth especially during the pandemic. And we did see some, some pretty strong you know, growth areas. So you did see a, a spurt in immigrant employment uh, growth in, in high wage sectors like professional services. You know? But you also saw a high growth in employ, high employment growth in low wage sectors like accommodation and food services or warehousing and transportation. So your Uber drivers, your Amazon delivery drivers, your DoorDash delivery drivers, people working in McDonald's, that is the low wage trap that is concerning. So you can only mitigate that through skills and education, uh, you know, training. And there are some challenges with that. I believe I had two minutes to, to do this. So I'm going to, you know, my stop clock is going, to, is going to go. So I'm going to stop right here. But as an economist, of course, we look at longer, uh, larger trends. And that's where I can speak to it. And we can come back to this point again. Um, and let Michelle um, go on for now. <laughs> Thank you, Shalini. Um, the point that you made about the timing is, is, is very important. I, I came here at 14 and, and struggled all throughout high school, as opposed to my sister who, who came here at nine years old, and now she's in university for, for biomedical engineering. So there is there is a bit of a... Of a um, timing is a big thing, yes. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Michelle, I will ask you the next question. Um, I look forward to hearing your perspective on this as someone who promotes youth workforce inclusion, what challenges and opportunities do you see newcomer immigrant youth facing in the labor market today? Yeah, sure, thanks for the question. Also, thank you for having me here. Um, I guess I'm the, the youth perspective uh, to the data of the research report um, in this panel. So um, based on my experience, not only as a second generation immigrant back home in Germany, but also as a recent newcomer here and having worked with refugee as well in the past, I have seen people struggle with different barriers um, and I've experienced some of them myself. Um, a lot of it has been actually picked up on the report. So I very much see myself reflected in it. Um, one major thing which I saw recurring was, for example, language barrier, as you mentioned, Carl, uh, even yourself. Um, but sometimes it's not even speaking about target language, even if we go specific, into the specifics as in being fluent in a target language. Sometimes uh, it's also just the professional jargon you're not acquainted to. Maybe I would know what you're talking about in my mother tongue, but just on the professional level, I might lack some vocabulary, which um, just simply takes time to, to just grasp on and kind of get yourself into. Then, of course, we already mentioned that as well, credential recognition. Um, another major aspect of that's probably to those immigrant youth who have already, let's say, are the older range of youth and who have already completed part of the education or professional development, where the credentials or work experiences is not recognized. Um, I've heard the stories, for example, from my mother go through it as an immigrant youth to Germany, where she had to go somewhere and work in a completely different field of study, 
And even I myself, when uh, I came here with my German degree, uh, I cannot actually work in the field of study. I studied for, for multiple years. So that's something I even personally see um, with the issues of credential recognition there. And of course, kind of adds on to it if you come in, especially later, is the lack of network, whether it's the social network or even the professional network. When I came here, I barely knew anyone um, considering my only experience was here studying abroad for a matter of four months and that has been six years back so those connections already broke off naturally and of course professionally since I don't have any Canadian work experience I came here with no professional network which um, then also um, both builds up a barrier when you apply for jobs as in references because um, just as a side note or side fact back home in Germany it's not a standard procedure to put references as your application and when I even applied for volunteer opportunities and I was asked for professional references, I struggled with that just merely off the fact because I didn't have the network. So I was just like, great, who am I? Now I have to try to find any sort of opportunities to engage with people to just create a network from ground up to then just apply for jobs afterwards. Um, and all of this, I, I see people, it, it leads to qualified people working in in jobs that don't match their experience, what Shalini also mentioned, this, this trap, I saw people with double master's degrees working in, in your local gym, uh, just simply to, to start off their employment here in Canada. And of course, what Serana also said, um, cultural differences, bias, discrimination, um, it can go ex as extreme as discrimination. Um, for myself, I, 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 can, I can come as a lucky and privilege that I did not experience discrimination per se myself. But there is still cultural differences as minor as there is you you would think canada germany is not a big of difference but let's say to just illustrate it for instance in Ger i was brought up very much in german directness being straight to the point avoiding any sort of unnecessary small talk because we're very quite straightforward in types of communication and although it's just a minor communication concern it has some sort of um, effect on how people perceive you as a person and professionally as well as personally. And it's just something to accustom yourself to, just to, to ask people how they're doing as, as funny as it sounds, but back home, it's not a standard practice to just ask someone how they're doing on a daily basis or start off your emails like that. It's just across all communication channels, just some like really minor thing, which still sticks to me till this day. And I sometimes have to even remind myself till this day. And, as for opportunities, although there's a lot of negative aspects, um, I see opportunities in predominantly, I guess, entrepreneurship, mentorship, and intercultural learning. I guess um, I, that's my own take on it. Uh, when the system, well, the traditional job market doesn't really serve you fa in favor, uh, it, motivates, it motivates you to find your own ways. So I saw also a lot of immigrant youth who came here and starting off their own businesses, um, which may or may not be influenced by the fact how the system's treating them. Um, but I saw a lot of immigrants, um, at least here and also on the, on the East Coast, uh, to open up their own businesses successfully. And at, at last, I guess, mentorship and intercultural learning. Um, immigrants, I, I would like to pride myself, I guess, and maybe Carl as well, um, anyone who has immigrated to a different country brings a lot of resilience because they had to go through their own personal struggles um, each on a very individual level, but immigration is a big thing to just shift countries, leave your family, friends behind and kind of step in, put a new step into a country. So this resilience and their experience, they're also just as valuable as the mentorship you can get from professionals here in Canada. So it's a very much a two way opportunity for people to learn from one another, both professionally, as well as maybe also some of the soft skills. It's, it's just an opportunity for learning and growth. Um, yeah, both professionally and personally. So I would just probably sum up the, the challenges and opportunities as in what has been pretty much brought up in the report as in credential recognition, language, um, network, mostly discrimination. And then yet again, this exchange, this interpersonal level we can get into as an opportunity for growth. Thank you, Michelle. I like your perspective. And I like everyone else's perspective on this as well. Thank you all. This was a great way to frame our discussion today. Shalini, I'd like to turn to you for this next question. I wonder if you could speak to the important, sorry, I wonder if you could speak to the different experiences of immigrant youth in Canada versus other groups like established immigrants or students here on study permits. How, di how different are these experiences and why do they exist? Thank you, Carl. That's a good question. And uh, let me just start off by saying that the experiences are naturally different 
differences. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm, I'm blathering. <laughs> the experiences are, are really quite different for each of these groups because they are different by definition. You know, they have yeah. every, different things defining each and every one of them. Uh, so to, to clarify that a little further, um, established immigrants are usually those who've been here, immigrant youth, since we are focusing on immigrant youth. Established immigrant youth are, have been here 10 years or longer. Okay. So they likely came as children. It's, it's, it's um, the bulk of them came as children. The most of them came as children. So it's likely that their parents are the ones who had suffered what we call in the literature, a negative entry effect, which basically means that when you enter the country, your earnings and employment takes a huge hit, you know, compared to the native born. So it, it, you basically have a depressed uh, employment income for a pretty long time until it sort of assimilates over a, like 15 years, 20 years. But what's been happening, we've been seeing in the data that that time has been taking longer and longer because the negative entry effect for each successive cohort has been becoming bigger and bigger. So people are taking longer and longer and longer for their wages to really take off. So this negative entry effect was likely felt more by the parents of established immigrants who experienced this overqualification. I mean, you've heard of stories of a, you know, there was a rocket scientist from China who was flipping burgers on Young Street. You know, I, it was before you, you know, it was from the nineties, you know, we, we learned about those sort, sort of stories. So there, there's this overqualification issue that's far more uh, valid for older immigrants than it is for immigrant youth. But that's because I'm talking about established immigrants, okay? When we're talking about newer and uh, you know older and older cohorts of immigrant youth who are coming in as teens and as older, that's when they're facing a lot of problems. You know where you where they do take this uh, have this negative entry effect uh, coming into operation, which is why I alluded to sort of you know uh, an improvement in um, settlement services for them, increasing the safety net for these uh, recent newcomer immigrant youth. Okay. But there's also education and skills training that can mitigate that to a great extent, and it, it does. But herein lies the catch, and that's the problem that we saw in the data when we worked on the report, that uh, while employment rates during the pandemic for immigrant youth, including newcomer immigrant youth, you know, increased and improved, okay, so they were engaging more in, in the labor market, they were finding employment more. At the same time, their participation in education rather their attendance at school was falling, okay? So that is the troubling aspect. They're working more, but they're studying less. And we didn't see that effect with Canadian-born youth. Canadian-born youth, it was more or less steady. In fact, enrollment actually increased during the pandemic, okay? So they're steadily acquiring skills, you know, whereas this pool of labor, immigrant youth, especially newcomer immigrant youth, are uh, having greater and greater hardship. We are worried about, for example, those um, school attendance rates falling. That is that is uh, something that uh, you know we we don't know whether it is just a one-off or whether it is a trend. So that's the other thing. Okay, let's just put an asterisk on that. But if we were to extend that logic or that that finding to another group of students, you know, international students who are here on temporary permits, they are here to study. Okay, then it becomes even more troubling because what has happened over the last you know, 20 years, since 2000, actually, you'll see T4 filings of international students has sort of hit the roof. It's really, really increased. They're participating in the labor market in a huge way, okay? And that is the problem because a lot of them also are coming from non-university college backgrounds. So why is that a problem? Because they might likely be stuck in that precisely that low wage trap that I was talking about earlier, okay? So, then, of course, we have need a question, but what are we doing with our immigration policy, our two-step immigration policy? Recently, for example, we know that uh, the government of Canada lifted the 20-hour limit for international students that they could work off campus. Now, that's a great idea in the short run because it means that they're participating more in the labor market, they're satisfying Canadian labor deficits you know, in several, several sectors quite much more. But there are long-term implications because it basically means that they will take longer to, to get educated and longer to assimilate in the labor market in the long run. So there are long-run sort of effects that are not very good, you know. And so these are real problems with these various pools of labor, established immigrant youth, recent immigrant youth, and international students that we need to be aware of. And we really do need to talk about this. 
I'll stop right here. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini. That is extremely interesting. Um, next, I'd like to ask Teresa, um, we've already heard a little bit about resiliency in youth. How would, you how would you define resiliency as it relates to immigrant youth and the labor force? And how can we better support their resiliency? Thanks so much, Carl, for that question. Um, so immigrant youth, they are, in, are an integral piece of Canada's now and emerging workforce. Um, so in light of the challenges that we've gotten a chance to kind of talk through at the beginning, and, and we've also heard some from Shalini as well, um, and you'll hear a lot more in the breakout rooms later on, the um, story of immigrant and refugee youth here in Canada is, is one of tremendous resilience. Um, so we can talk about it from the perspective of their ability to navigate the labor market and experience higher rates of educational attainment. As we heard, like um, youth are attending um, post-secondary edu education. They are attaining higher levels of educational attainment, but at the same time, um, they are facing more difficulty when it comes to latching on to the labor market um, later on. And we've seen that this kind of has resulted or been a, additional strain has been placed on this um, throughout the pandemic across a range of metrics. So we see that even at this time, they are navigating the labor market at a time of chronic labor shortages and skill shortages. Um, there has been the transition to remote work, online learning. And I would say that the environment is very unpredictable and also a little bit volatile, but at the same time, they are navigating all of these rapidly changing um, environments and circumstances, and they're able to work towards building a more solid foundation for them um, that facilitates their success. So they are still making strides towards building their social capital, expanding their networks, ensuring that they have the supports available, available for them to, to be successful. Right? They are doing this amongst um, being able to support their families both in Canada and abroad with different commitments that they have. Um, and um, we see also that they are making strides in the area of representation as referenced earlier and advocacy. Right, um, Carl, both you and Michelle are here um, sharing more of your experience as it pertains to being um, youth who have immigrated to Canada and sharing your experiences and being able to use that as a tool for advocacy. And I think that in, 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 in recognizing these experiences and amplifying them, this is the way in which we're able to further support youth in building their resiliency. Um, so I would also move on to say that um, supporting youth in their resiliency means equipping them with the future-proof opportunities and skills that they can leverage throughout labor market transformations as we've recently seen with the pandemic and, and beyond. Um, so as we move towards the recovery post-pandemic, we should be able to um, add more investments into career development support, um, maintaining and amplifying current efforts. I know that across the immigration sector, as well as um, different advocacy spaces, research, there is somewhat of a silo effect in that there are a lot of great initiatives that are happening across different sectors, but we're not always aware of them, even working within them. Um, so being able to break down these silos and, and further coordinate and engage with each other, as we're doing on this platform, I, we have a couple of organizations that are represented here. And so this is a great a great way to showcase um, the way to work together towards um, the common goal of supporting immigrant youth long term. I'd also say um, opening doors for youth. So as I mentioned earlier about um, engaging with youth throughout um, the decision making process, having them a part of the discussion, helping them frame the discussion towards solutions. Um, I would also say that this is um, investing in further opportunities for them to, to share their expertise. And then I would also say that we work um, more intentionally towards addressing barriers that are faced by youth. And these are across uh, the many different areas that we've, that we've spoken about previously. So that's what I'm kind of thinking towards resiliency as it pertains to immigrant youth. Thank you, Theresa. Um, this is also a great segue into my next question for Serena. Um, Serena, there's a lot of talk about how resilient economy is a green economy. And there seems to be a great deal of opportunity there for youth. What are some potential pathways for immigrant youth in Canada's green economy, and how can they be supported to pursue those opportunities? Uh, thank you. I, I'm just sitting here in awe of uh, my colleagues on the panel learning so much. So thank you for putting together such a great panel. Um, so the green economy in Canada really does bring uh, lots of potential pathways for immigrant youth, um, especially as the demand for skilled workers in you know, sectors such as renewable energy, clean technology, um, 
And as energy and efficiency increases, there are opportunities for you to really pursue careers in these fields. Um, and here, for example, at Skills for Change, we, we, you know, over the years we've had a, um, a youth greening project um, that we now got funding from the TD Ready Commitment um, Fund. So they provided us with a million dollars to launch across five um, localities in Toronto, our youth climate action program. And also we are funding uh, for the provincial government to do a STEM program for black and racialized youth. So this allow Skills for Change and our team to help to support new career pathways um, identification and training in net zero and the trade sector for our clients. Um, and we focus on immigrant, newcomer, and racialized youth to prepare them for these opportunities. What's really great is this project, the Youth Climate Action Project, is youth-led. We're going to work with 200 youth over the next year to develop climate project, climate um, projects that focus on tackling climate change and building resilient communities, but also would also provide them with a skills development and career management to identify professional development and training and career pathways in the green sector. Um, so that's really critical. Another important thing is that micro skilling and career pathway programs needs to be developed broadly and they, because they are crucial um, in providing young people with the skills and the knowledge they would need to identify and access and prepare themselves for opportunities in the green economy. So through our project, for example, the Climate Action Project and our STEM projects, we're providing really targeted training in specific areas, such as you know, energy efficiency, um, sustainable business practices, so that we can ensure that the young people are well prepared um, to meet the demands of the very rapidly evolving um, green sector. And these micro skilling and career pathway programs are really critical for immigrant youth um, to for them to know that these opportunities exist in the green economy, because it'll help them to develop those skills they need to succeed, succeed in the industry and to provide the guidance on the steps they need to take to advance their careers. Um, so one of those most really exciting aspects of the green economy, which is that allows opportunity creation for, for young racialized newcomer immigrant folks is especially those with STEM skills. So, you know, uh, as mentioned, you know, there are a lot uh, by my fellow panelists, there are newcomers who come in with international education already in, in science and technology. That could really help to play a critical role in, in their developing and implementing innovative solutions to address climate change through new projects, products, and solutions they can develop. Um, we, we can also guide these racialized youth and newcomer youth to be young entrepreneurs in the green space to help create some sustainable business that are aimed at addressing environmental challenges and that can generic, you know, create economic opportunities from, for them and others. Uh, and so by supporting them through these targeted training and mentorship, I've mentioned mentorship already, but it's so critical, we can help them bring the ideas to fruition and they could, you know, at the same time, really make impactful impact on the world working in the green space. But we have to support them. So in order to support immigrant youth to take advantage of, of, of opportunities in, in the green economy, it's really essential to provide them with access to the education and training that would prepare them. I talked about mentorship earlier, but networking programs that connect these young folks with industry professionals can help them gain insights into the industry, um, make those connections, and um, acts, create greater access to potential career pathways. But we still have to address the systemic barriers that may prevent those immigrant youth from accessing these opportunities. We've talked about it. We have to keep talking about it, but discrimination, lack of access to resources are there. They're there, there remains there. We have to address these barriers to ensure that all young people have a chance to succeed in Canada's green economy. Um, so some of these barriers could also include restrictive gender norms, right? Um, which can prevent young people from seeking green jobs and structural, and these, there are structural gaps, there are roadblocks, including um, lack of supportive services or lack of finance or collateral for accessing loans to, you know, move the ideas for a, a green solution or tool or product forward. The other thing is a majority of the jobs creating a green transition are expected to um, occur in traditionally male dominated technical sectors, which means that we need to take some intentional measures um, to ensure that women and girls, um, you know, as newcomer women and girls, that young women and girls are not further marginalized um, in the green economy. But there are positive things to look forward to, right? Uh, as more businesses and industries uh, prioritize their sustainability and environmental responsibility, 
there will be a growing demand for workers who have expertise in green technologies or you know, renewable energy or sustainable business practices. And this really does present opportunities for young immigrant racialized folks to develop these skills in the areas and to become leaders in the emerging green economy. So at Skills for Change, we are committed to supporting young people in pursuing these economies through our youth climate action projects that are geared to what's not just bringing awareness of our climate issues, but developing technical and other solutions to help build a more resilient and sustainable future for all and ensuring that racialized immigrant youth are aware of the opportunities that exist in the green economy, uh, well prepared to um, take advantage of those opportunities and are provided with the tools and skills um, and the resiliency to be able to forge ahead and be successful in the green economy. So I encourage folks who are on the call or, or um, who are you know, young people on the call who may not have thought about the, the green economy and net zero jobs to really explore that, you know, connect to skillsforchange.org to look at our projects. And I want to encourage career practitioners who are on the call to really, you know, help direct your clients into this particular path um, for the training opportunities that exist, the jobs that exist, so that they are prepared for the jobs of the future. Thank you very much, Serena. That's very interesting. Um, I'm next for Michelle. I have a final question for you before we wrap up our panel today and move into discussion groups. As a young professional who is also a newcomer to Canada, what supports and services have you found most helpful in navigating the neighbor market? And what do you see areas for improvement? So yeah, maybe as a disclaimer for background for um, since it wasn't advertised in any of the, the material. So my experience of support services is very much interconnected of my experience coming here um, recently, not as an international student, but straight on as a worker. Hence, um, some of those standard resources, such as like universities, international centers were not available to me. So um, maybe that's on the note, because I, I assume that uh, international students uh, really have the access to like those centers as a first spot to connect with um, as part of the universities. Unfortunately, I didn't have that. So um, personally, I found um, most helpful were those support services that very much offered one-on-one -on -one support. Um, so while it was helpful to, to find guides on, on where to look for jobs, um, how to apply for a job specifically, and how to structure a resume, because that's different to like however it's home, structured back home, it was really helpful to have a person to like dissect your application, go into the resume, go into the details, into the descriptions, and help you apply for each job application, just because a guide offers you a job, like an ideal job application, in, a version of it, but each job application is very unique to your personal experiences as well as the responsibilities advertised in the job ad. So just having that one-on-one -on -one support was really helpful. And um, while I personally took uh, most of my support and help from, from people I knew socially and not professionally, I coincidentally came across um, support services. And um, I guess this is what strikes me the most, um, which very connects to what Teresa said is there are services, but I was not aware of them. Oftentimes, um, it was due to mere coincidence that I found out about them. And um, just simply because a newcomer, I didn't know where to look for them. So it's very much, I'm not sure if it's a marketing strategy or maybe, I don't know, finding other ways of streamlining to raise awareness of those resources. But it was very much the where to find them and not if they're there, because um, when I dig deeper and then even through coincidences, I figured out there were those support services, but I just simply knew didn't know where to look for them. I guess just for instance, to illustrate this matter, it might, might seem funny and odd, and it's just like a light laughter here, I guess, in this context of the panel. We don't have YMCA at home. So when I was walking past the YMCA here in Halifax, it is a fitness facility and childcare facility. Never in my med mind had it crossed it that it could have also have employment services. Because for me, it was just an odd connection having a gym and employment services connected. But Turns out YMCA also has employment services, which I was not aware of. And I very much just came across this fact through a mutual friend whose friend turned out to be an employee of those services. So never in my mind would have I had my find myself online looking up for YMCA employment services because I just simply didn't have the connection because I simply never related to, to the brand of YMCA with employment services. Or even I came across ISENS, which is the Immig Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia, not because I've read it somewhere, but I saw randomly people who I 
New from university back then, from my one semester abroad, which I spent here, who now suddenly start positions with them. And I'm like, oh, congratulate this person on LinkedIn for starting a position with iSense. I said, iSense, what is that? And then after looking them, I'm like, oh, wait, great. That's something I can look into. So it's very much what, and just again, stress what Teresa said, the awareness, the, there is, technically speaking, the resources are there. It's just the readily availability and the awareness, which um, I guess is a certain or like maybe a special barrier for those newcomers who come in without any sort of network. So I didn't have an academic network, neither did I have a professional network. So it would have been really much of a help to have a person to sit down with me and have a normal talk. And maybe as part of the conversation, I would find out, okay, these are the resources which you can talk to. So it doesn't necessarily require a support service, which gives me already help, but kind of a mediator to forward me and guide me towards those right resources. So I guess um, I would like to put the stress on um, mentorship opportunities, um, just simply because through this mentorship, not only can we learn from one another, um, but even let's say for one barrier, which I brought up was references, right? As part of job applications. Maybe if you get a mentor, who's of course established in his professional network, that might already give you at least one professional reference, which helps you to start off your job applications with, um, aside from the fact of navigating this overwhelming space of resources, which you don't even know exist. So um, very much stress on mentorship opportunities or just like mediating, making resources more visible. And if offering services, very much put stress on, on this one-on-one -on -one mentorship or one-on-one -on -one support as in, review job applications or just I guess navigating the new environment because it's not just work in the end it's it's a new life you're starting in a new country so I guess one-on-one -on -one support and awareness is the main thing I would like to highlight for this last question thank you Michelle um yeah those services are really very, very important especially when you come um to this country at a later age as Shalini was saying that timing is everything as an immigrant so uh, thank you. Uh, I'm so glad to hear your perspective as a newcomer in this dialogue. And I know that we'll have an opportunity to explore this more in the breakout room um, discussions. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, thank you, Shalini, Theresa, Serena, and Michelle for joining us today. This was a great discussion to kick off the event. And I know that I certainly learned a lot. I'm going to turn it back over to Anne now, who will tell us all about discussion groups. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl, and thank you to all of our panelists again. Uh, we really appreciate this rich discussion about the many opportunities and many barriers for immigrant youth in Canada. If any of our attendees today have questions for the panelists, we invite you to pop them into the chat and continue the dialogue there. We'll also have an opportunity to speak more about these topics in the breakout rooms we're about to join. Um, so here's what's happening next. So in about two minutes, you'll all be automatically assigned by Zoom into one of three discussion groups where you'll hear a short overview of your discussion host work and interest areas as it relates to immigrant and newcomer youth in the labor force. And you'll have an opportunity for questions and dialogue. After 20 minutes, you'll see a countdown timer on your screen that will alert you that you'll be moved into a new discussion group uh, in about one minute. Uh, you'll have 20 minutes in that next discussion group, and then that timer is gonna happen again. You'll jump into the third discussion group. By the end of an hour, you'll have had an opportunity to participate in all three discussions, and we'll return here to the main room to close out our event for the day. So please give us just a minute while our team moves everyone into their groups, and we'll see you shortly. Hi everyone, welcome back from your discussions. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the breakout rooms and apologies for the technical hiccups. We know better for next time. Um, so on behalf of LMIC, I wanna say a big thank you to our moderator, our panelists and our discussion hosts, as well as to CCYP and Wes for their support and engagement in this event. In just a moment, a very short survey is going to pop up on your screen. It's only four questions, and we're looking for your feedback about your experience today. So we hope that you will share your thoughts. Thank you again, everyone, and have a lovely afternoon wherever you're joining us from.